This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a production of Dream of the Open Channel. It's July 2013, and this is Episode 9, Listening to Silence, The Fermi Paradox, Part 2. Welcome. This is your host, Paul Carr. In this episode, we are once again going to talk about the Fermi Paradox. I would like to refer you back to episode two of this podcast, an episode that featured a conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Landis about the Fermi Paradox, and I encourage you to listen to that episode if you have not already done so. There we took as our ground rule that there are no visitors are colonists from other worlds in evidence here at all, the so-called Fact A. We'll also take Fact A as a given here in this episode. Our ongoing discussion of Bracewell probes and the search for extraterrestrial artifacts, in general, notwithstanding. The assumption of Fact A is surprising, as we will hear. If we assume the principle of mediocrity, that there is nothing special about the Earth or humanity, a reasonable, if unverified, assumption, given the principle of mediocrity, there should be other worlds like our own, and other technological species like our own, and there has been plenty of time for intelligent beings to completely colonize our galaxy many times over. Dr. Landis pointed out, I think correctly, that as colonists venture out into the galaxy, they are likely to have their own problems and evolve their own solutions, adapting to life as they find it. Whether they continue to expand and colonize after they arrive at their initial set of destinations is not certain. They may well choose not to, and make this choice at least somewhat independently of any exploratory or expansionist drive they may have had when they left their home world. In other words, Landis is skeptical that biology is destiny when it comes to the conquest of the vast distances between habitable worlds. If you model this sort of outward expansion, you may find that large volumes of space remain uncolonized if the probability of continued colonization is below some critical level. And there we largely left it. We don't know if this sort of model really works or some other model of galactic colonization makes more sense. But if you make the simple-minded assumption that once a species of biological or even trans-biological beings start to colonize, it will keep doing so, then there has been plenty of time for one or more species to completely colonize the galaxy. We also touched on the same problem in Episodes 3 and 6. Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute does not think that Fact A means that we are alone. Just the interstellar colonization is far too costly to maintain an ongoing program. For SETI researchers, it makes far more sense to send carefully selected photons rather than material probes out into the galaxy. And those photons are what they are looking for. So, I have two simple-minded questions to start with on the Fermi Paradox. One, is it really a paradox? A number of scientists have had a go at modeling galactic colonization, and generally their answer is yes, it is indeed a paradox. Later, we'll ask Dr. Duncan Forgan if the vast distances between stars really do prohibit interstellar travel. Two, how can we resolve this paradox? There have been many solutions proposed to this, some of them quite disconcerting. As imaginative as we are with our solutions, we need much more information to decide between them, or possibly to learn that we haven't been imaginative enough. In this podcast, we are slowly working our way down the list and trying to understand the implication of each possible solution to the Fermi Paradox. As I see it, 
the explanations boil down into four basic categories. One, they are or were here, but we just can't recognize it for some reason. By ground rule, we're not going to approach that topic just now. But we will soon as we continue with our SETA, Search for Extraterrestrial Artifacts, and Bracewell Probe discussion in subsequent episodes. Stay tuned. Two, they could be here, but have chosen not to be. Three, they can't be here because of some inherent limitation of advanced technological civilizations. By the way, I hope to talk to David Grinspoon more about this possibility when his new book comes out. Four, they don't exist. We really are alone, at least in our galaxy. Now, all sorts of science-minded people have taken on the paradox with many different creative solutions. Founder of Universe Today and software entrepreneur Fraser Crane is one of these. As you will hear, Fraser finds the Fermi paradox genuinely perplexing. And like me, he recognizes that answers are not at hand, and we have to ask the questions better. I think that when people consider the Fermi paradox, they really need to sort of put that in, sort of they need to consider a few basic sort of common structures first before they really kind of then evaluate all these possible answers to the Fermi paradox. So, you know, one of the things is that, you know, we are not, you know, the concept of homogeneity that, you know, that, that, that the whole universe is sort of the same. And any one part of the universe is no different from any other part of the universe. The laws of physics are going to be the same. The, the, uh, you know, the the distances, the speeds, the size of galaxies, the size of stars, all that's going to be the same. And so, Earth isn't special. The whole universe, you know, chances are, if, if life arose here, then life could arise in other places as well. And so, you know, I think that's really important to, to think about. The the second thing is to sort of really think about sort of the the age of the of the universe the fact that the universe is you know 13.8 billion years old and we you know our star has only been around for 4.6 billion years so there have been and and when you think about how how long it took us to go from you know from a sort of an ape like ancestor to or even you know to, to, to be the modern humans that we are, it was only just a couple of million years. And really, you know, like 100,000 years for modern human beings to kind of get to the point from, from the first uses of technology all the way to our modern space age. So, you know, how many times has a 100,000 year period existed in the age of the, of the universe? Many, 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 many times. So, so the sort of the preponderance towards it happening everywhere and often i mean that's what it seems like it's just like it's there's been so much time and there's so many stars and there's so many galaxies that it really should have should have happened all over the place so that's the first thing and then it gets even more common when you think about it because you know we you know we don't have the technology quite yet but you can imagine a situation um you know in a hundred years maybe where we can create a probe that can make another version of itself and so we make a spacecraft, you know, it's, it's a, you know, by MakerBot <laughs> and they, and we take that spacecraft and we send it to the moon and it lands on the moon and it pulls all the raw materials or it lands on an asteroid and just, you know, extracts all the raw resources and makes another version of itself. And then the, then the two spacecrafts part ways and one goes to one asteroid, another goes to a different asteroid. And then now you have four and then you have eight, and then you have 16 and these spacecraft are you know, and you can imagine some kind of technology that, you know, maybe you could send this thing over to a nearby star system and then it's going to do the same thing. And while it's there, it's going to construct a monolith on every single world. And it's going to be obvious that this monolith is there and <clears throat> it's going to come back and refresh the monolith every, you know, couple of hundred thousand years just to make sure that it's really obvious that the monolith is, is there. And so, you know, even, you know, you're not looking to break the laws of physics, 
you're looking to to just be able to have one of these spacecraft just make it and then and then multiply and then make it to the next star and multiply and so you know the conservative estimates i've seen are anywhere between one and ten million years to fully colonize the entire galaxy to put a you know all 400 billion stars to put a, a monolith on every object on every in every star system in the entire galaxy so so I think when people think about like, well, you know, like what if they're really far away or what if we can't communicate or all those kinds of things, they have to look at that with this filter of, yeah, but it only has to arise in one location anywhere in the entire galaxy. And then within a couple, you know, a few million years, it will have colonized the entire galaxy. So, you know... Whenever people say, yeah, but what about this? I say, like, in 100% of the time, in every single circumstance, that's going to be the case. So so I think that's that's really important for people to sort of con to consider that that framework is like, you know, and the, and the best analogy that I have is, is a sandwich. You know, you leave a sandwich out on the, you know, on the table, <clears throat> and it's going to get covered in bacteria. And it doesn't matter where that initial colony of bacteria started, Give it a couple of days and it will be on the whole sandwich. And we as life are the bacteria in the galaxy and you put a little bit of us anywhere in this galaxy and it's going to fully expand to colonize the, the entire thing in a, in a blink of, uh, you, know, you know, astronomically speaking, just in a blink of the eye. So, so that's, I think, you know, and then, I, and then when I look at all of these responses to the Fermi paradox, they all come up lacking because, you know... Because you're like, well, what if they just, you know, what if they're just not into hanging out with us? Yeah, but all of them, 100% of them, like the one on this star system, the one on that star system, yeah, there's going to be variations. One group of aliens would be, you know, totally want to hang out on their own and not interact with anyone else. But it, you just need one, and then it's going to take over the whole galaxy. And then that's the one that we, whose monoliths we'd be running into. So that's my, that's my filter that I look at the Fermi Paradox responses to. Don't you have to add into that... Uh, well, I mean, we don't know for sure, but when I talked to Jeffrey Landis about this, um, he said the one thing, the one conclusion he'll draw from the Fermi paradox without reservation is that interstellar travel is really, really difficult. Because if it wasn't, we'd see probes well, all over the place. R yes. Well, I mean, yes, it's really difficult. But I think there's like, there's convenient, like, let's hop in our spacecraft and let's zip off to Alpha Centauri for, for you know, v you know, pangalactic gargle blasters. And, and then let's, you know, let's create a spacecraft that is capable of reaching that other star and self-replicating. And I think that's a very different thing. You know, we have already sent Voyager 2 almost out of the solar system. And in 77,000 years, it's going to reach roughly the nearest star system. And so even on that time scale, if Voyager 2 had the capability to self-replicate itself, it would start to colonize the entire galaxy. So I think we could, you know, we could sit down and say, well, if, you know, once we have this self-replication ability, and that feels inevitable, I mean, you know, it feels like we're going to have those in the next hundred years, you know, have a spacecraft that can go and extract resources and you know set up a little factory on a asteroid and pull all the material it needs and and 3d print all of the pieces that it requires and then hit the road and go on to its next target um and then you know maybe it's going to take us a thousand years to send a spacecraft to alpha centauri using a really fast methodology or maybe whatever ten thousand who cares hundred thousand we'll slower than voyager 2 doesn't matter you're going to send it and then it's going to replicate and then it's going to go to the next place and so on and so forth. So, so I agree that it is that, it, that the implication is that it's hard in that it's not convenient and it probably will never be convenient for us to just hop in our warp drive and pop off to the nearest star. But I think that, that on the flip side, you have to say, you know, does it break the laws of physics? And I don't think it does. We have already demonstrated Voyager is on its way. Well, the other th point that Landis made, uh, in fact, he, published a paper on this about 24 years ago was that um, as colonizing agents spread out to nearby star systems, given the difficulties that they'll face and in, in moving on to the next star, there, there's, a, there's a 
probability that they won't make it, that they won't, that they won't be able to self-replicate or colonize or build a new set, you know, refuel or whatever it is they have to do to, to move on. And if that probability is below a certain critical threshold, then you get big gaps, you get big voids in, in, the, in the resulting colonization. Now those voids get mixed up a little bit as stars move around, and so it's not that neat, but it's, you, you can conceivably say, well, if the probability is less than about 40%, you're gonna have some colonized areas and some uncolonized areas, depending on you know, a whole raft of assumptions that you make. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I and I think, you know, but it, but again, I mean, it feels like it's hard, but it isn't an insurmountable engineering challenge, right? I mean, I think if we talked to Jeffrey Landis and said, make us a warp drive, he would be, he would like, I, I probably can't ever. And nobody will ever and even in a billion years, nobody will ever do this. But you know, make a make a self replicating probe, you know, with unlimited resources, you can have the entire resources of humanity to try and build a spacecraft that can get to, you know, a nearby dwarf star and find an asteroid and replicate itself, uh, maybe, maybe it could happen. So, and then it's just time. Just time is, is, is the great leveler. A self-replicating probe is going to be a lot more complex than just a simple probe. Right? It's going to, just as a factory is more complex than the products it produces. So um, there's an economical issue there right i mean well no i mean once you have a i mean if you can make the thing in the first place i mean that's i mean when you consider a bacteria right like if a bacteria didn't have to self-replicate then it would be a lot simpler you know its job would be you know we would just all would have to do is like hang out and eat and grow fat and then eventually die and that would be that but but i mean a bacteria is all about making more bacteria and so much of its machinery is just about self-replication so I think, you know, we look, nature has evolved a, you know, a almost perfectly capable self-replicating thing. If we could get that bacteria to a reasonable world, we could colonize, you know, it like crazy with bacteria. But now the bacteria wouldn't be making a spacecraft that could then travel to other worlds. But the point is, you know the capability of self-replication has been designed, so now you need to bring those things together. I mean, you know, it just it just feels to me, you know, in all of these cases, like, like as I look at where things are going with the 3D printing, as I look at where things are going with um, spacecraft going to other worlds, you know, and time is long, it just, it doesn't feel impossible to me, which makes me feel that the, that the solution to the Fermi paradox is you know, a lot more kind of as an existential thing. Like there's something really significant that we're missing because so far none of it seems impossible to me. What about the lifetime of civilizations that get sophisticated enough to do that? Do they live long? Well, it's the same thing, right? You know, yeah. I mean, go back to that, that analogy of the bacteria, you know, in that you know, you're going to have some bacteria that are going to last a long time and some that aren't, but it doesn't matter. As long as one, just one, is able to self-replicate, then it's going to eat the whole sandwich. And it's the same thing with this galaxy. You know, yeah, you're going to have a, you're going to have short-lived ones. You're going to have, you know, ones that have uh, that are self-destructive, and you're going to have ones that destroy their environment, and you're going to have ones that you know experiment with nuclear weapons and all that stuff. And you're going to have one that has somehow figured it out. I mean, you look at our own history. I mean, we pushed back from the brink of, you know, of annihilation many times over the last 50 years 100 years with you know nuclear weapons and war and and um, worldwide plagues and you know zombie apocalypses all that kind of stuff so so i think you know you roll the dice right and you just keep hoping that it that it keeps coming up you know doesn't come up snake eyes and you get to survive another day. And so for the civilizations out there, you start off with 100 and, uh, you know, 99 of them wipe themselves out, but one makes it through and then it colonizes the entire galaxy. So, so again, I, like I said, I, I, I get that instinctual response, which is like, well, what if one could, you know, what if it's just really hard? And then I have to always respond and say, 
is it 100% hard? That's what we're looking for. We're looking for things that will stop at 100% of the time. That if you throw 10,000 civilizations at this challenge of, of, of creating self-replicating probes that can explore the galaxy, every single one of them has to fail. Those are the kinds of challenges. Those are the kinds of responses to the Fermi paradox that we have to find. So we're looking for say a galaxy wide catastrophe like well but then you would have but maybe but then you would be looking for no i mean uh, yeah i mean possibly uh, but then you would have to look at every single galaxy and you know would there be some kind of sign because then then you take that same thing and go well is this going to affect every single galaxy well you know what you know what would i mean we, would we be seeing colonists from other galaxies Sure. Yeah, you can imagine. Um, you know, if if a civilization hits type three, right? The type three, what is it? Kardashev scale. It, you know, it would be rearranging the stars in its galaxy to to sort of be best for its own use of of power. And so you would you would see a whole galaxy that instead had these nice spiral arms. You would see it in this sort of very intelligently arrayed format which allows an intelligent civilization to extract all of the energy out of it. So, yeah, we, we look out and we, you know, you look in the deep field and you don't see these really cool ring galaxies or, you know, cube galaxies and, you know, whatever shape would be most energy efficient. So we don't see that. So, so not only have we not found life in the, in the galaxy, we haven't seen evidence of life in any other galaxy either. Right. Well, I mean, perhaps it's a lot more subtle than we would recognize. Well, and then I say, but yeah, but in 100% of the cases, right? I mean, you know, there's this concept of a star of a stellar um, thruster, you know, and you could go and take a stellar, you could take a, a star and you could hook up a great big light sail and you could start to move that star around using its own light energy as thrust. And, you know, is the sort of natural shape of a galaxy the most energy efficient for some future civilization some power hungry civilization probably not so you might not be the, need to be that brute force you could perhaps i mean every galaxy has a huge black hole mm -hmm. in the center with which has enormous amounts of energy in it and you just need to keep it fed yeah That's well which, which will happen naturally or but you want to speed it up but the point right yeah you can open up your mouth and bugs are going to fly in and you'll be fed naturally or you go out there and find the food and, and gather it together and you organize it in the way that's most efficient. And I think, you know, this, is, this turns into a math problem. Some future civilization is going to say, how do we extract the most possible energy from this galaxy? And they will then arrange the galaxy in a way that, that supports that. And then we would see that. And we don't. Where do we go from there? If we, if we really think there's no evidence of highly advanced civilizations um, at least living long enough to colonize or become Kardashev level three civilizations, is there a research program we can draw from that? I mean, I'm not saying we have the answers, but what questions should we ask that we can actually do right. as observation? Well, and so that's the thing, right? And so, you, you know, I think that you have to look at the Fermi paradox and look for the answers that, that would either... You know, I mean, as as Landis said, you know, space flight is difficult, but you need to look for answers which are space flight is impossible, right? It can't be done. It cannot be done that there is some reason why we cannot travel to another star system. Um, that that you have to look for things, you know, be like, well, yeah, but what if civilizations wipe themselves out? Well, you know what? Now we're on the that's on the right track, but but you you have to go further than that. You have to say there is something almost inherent in the laws of physics that will force a civilization to wipe itself out. That, that it's almost destiny. That as you get rolling on being a future civilization, you will wipe yourself out. That there will be some, you know, and so you could example, for example, you know, and this is the great filter, right? The great filter argument. And it's, you know, it's, for me, it's very compelling, right? Which is that there are these sort of these two moments in the history of any civilization where everything gets everything gets wiped out right one is sort of the early on at the sort of at the point that life first evolves and then something comes along and and 
it, it inevitably wipes it out. And that didn't happen here. So the second concept is, is that you hit just the point of capability of traveling to other stars and then something wipes everything out. And, you know, and then you can imagine things, right? Like what if there is some kind of exotic power system, some inevitable exotic power system that we will attempt to research, which will wipe us all out. Or, um, you know, what the singularity is, a, is an example, the technological singularity, right? That, that as you move forward, the only way to move forward as an intelligent civilization is to create tools, <clears throat> more and more intelligent tools, and eventually the tools rise up and you get a robot apocalypse. But you wouldn't know? the robots themselves uh, want to propagate it, and colonize? A, they absolutely would. So, so the robot apocalypse is out. Right, because you would see evidence of the robot of the robot empire uh, moving around the uh, the galaxy. So, so it's something else that we don't know what it is. I have a nine year old son, and uh, I, I'm kind of partial to the Minecraft hypothesis that, <laughs> that we all disappear into a virtual world and never want to come out. But a hundred percent of the time, right? Again, we go back to that. A hundred percent of the time, there's going to be one, you know, one percent of civilizations who who realize that all this time spent, you know, playing Minecraft is uh, is not good for us, and we really need to get out, get some fresh air, and explore the the universe. So, I, you know, and it's the same thing, right? Like, yeah, every time you say, yeah, but what if, you know, what if we're in a zoo? Okay, great, but what if one plucky alien sneaks in past the cages and gives us some evidence that we actually live in this galactic civilization, you know? I think you just came up with a good idea for science fiction story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, um, yeah. The, and, and well, I, I mean, th the, the compelling part of that is that if you look at our own civilization, we've gotten very rapidly good at handling information uh, at astronomical, you know, at exponentially increasing scales. Energy, not much better. Uh, aeronautics, not much improvement in 50 years. Uh, you know, we still look back at the SR-71 and think that was a really kick-ass airplane. But, you know, and that was built in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s. So the, you know, it, when it comes to dealing with energy, we don't do so great, but when it deals with information, we do extremely well. We're getting simulations that are better and better and better. And, you know, potentially at some point, the simulations are so complete and so good, they're more desirable places to live in. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you have robots managing your energy and, and materials and you live inside the virtual world and you have no impetus to explore or colonize. You're, you're colonizing within your simulation. But the, you know, the, the drive for the robots would be to improve the power, the, the quality of the simulation and then they're going to go out seeking more energy and inevitably they're going to need to move away from the solar system and start bringing in other stars to provide more energy for the simulation so so again i mean i just think that you know that if we're around we will seek energy and if we're seeking energy uh then then it will we will inevitably extend out into the into the universe, into the galaxy. And so, but you can imagine some, again, some situation that, you know, you, you, there's some technological thing you reach and, you know, a, a very powerful computer has a tendency to turn into a black hole, you know, and, you know, is a possibility. Now, obviously it's not true, but, you know, you, there might be some point that, you know, information gets so dense that it turns into a black hole and destroys the earth. And so every civilization, you know, goes, computers are great, I love these powerful computers, and then you get to a certain point, and then the computer destroys the planet. And it's just inevitable, because everyone's going to want a computer, they're going to want a faster computer, they're going to want to play, you know, super-duper Minecraft, and then th that begins the downfall of their civilization. And and if it's unexpected, then it could happen in a heartbeat. And then you're like, whoa, where'd our planet go? <laughs> because we, you know, invested too much effort in computers. And I think it, that, you know, so I think it would be something that would be unexpected that every single civilization has to be 100% runs into this challenge and doesn't foresee it and it wipes them out. You know, that, you know, like that, like remember there was this sort of concern that that when you first turn on the Large Hadron Collider, you know, it was going to form this kind of strange matter and then <clears throat> the strange matter would move out at the speed of light 
uh, converting the you know regular matter into this new lower energy format at the speed you know and and that would do it right but that that would also take over the entire universe so the fact that that our universe is still here tells us that 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 probably d- will never happen right? um okay so let's get back to the research program okay we don't we don't know why that the fermi paradox is there in front of us uh it's almost every time we look at it it seems bigger and more more challenging where where should we look what what's the first thing we should do to try to resolve it well i i mean that's the that's the terrible irony is that we stand right now at the absolute you know the beginning of the age of the golden age of us being able to get to the bottom of this that you know there was you know there's the seti program which is listening but is drastically underfunded and should be you know expanded to be able to thoroughly search the skies there is the you know searching for these other kinds of things you know strange structures uh orbiting stars you can imagine you know looking for evidence of people you know of dyson spheres of people moving the stars around in their galaxies but the most interesting one is the search for life here in the solar system you know what's going on with the you know, not the Curiosity rover is it equipped to search for life, but the next version of the rover may be able to search for past life. And there have been experiments designed that may help to search for current life. Now, of course, you've got this concept of panspermia, where life could be moving back and forth between between Earth and Mars, and maybe they're interconnected, so it just doesn't matter. But the the most interesting thing is is what's going on with Kepler which unfortunately has died, um, and sort of follow on things like tests and other, and other missions like that. We're going to be, we have the technology now that we could launch a, a telescope into space that could, uh, that could resolve the atmosphere of extrasolar planets. And so you could look at another world, you could look at, at the atmosphere of that world, and you could tell whether or not there is life there. Because there are certain chemical processes that you would see in the atmosphere, which can only be generated by some, you know, some life form. Or, you know, so if you saw pollution, you know, you would go, oh, you know, not only is it an intelligent civilization, but they've got really bad traffic, right? Um, But you'd be able to see if you saw oxygen, if you saw, you know, various byproducts of, of life forms, you could know and just go life, life, no life, no life, life. And it would get, then the Fermi paradox would get super weird because you'd be like looking out and you would just see all of these planets out there, which you know have life on them. And yet no intelligent civilizations are broadcasting any signals. And, you know, so we might see life. We might see intelligent life. So so I think, you know, there was this concept of the terrestrial planet finder, which was this mission organized back in the, you know, was scheduled to launch, what, 2019, 2020, but then it got canceled. And it was, I mean, it would, it was the one. It You would launch this mission. It would have the ability to resolve these atmospheres. And it would tell us conclusively that there is or is not life within a fairly large sphere around us. And then I think that would, <clears throat> that would, that would be the most important, exciting, I think, discovery almost in human history. And we're right on the precipice of being able to do this. And there's not funding. It's, you know, kills me. That's basically filling in that, uh, that, that, third or fourth term in the Drake equation where this says right. how many planets actually have life given that they're that they are planets and they form in a habitable zone yeah and so if you look out and you see lots and lots of planets with life and you know and I, <clears throat> I talked to a researcher and there's this, you know the concept of panspermia that you know in fact not only is, is our asteroids moving back and forth between <clears throat> excuse me between our planets in our solar system, but in fact, there's, you know, we're leaving a trail of bacterial debris as the solar system is passing through the Milky Way. So you could actually imagine a situation where life is going from, from star to star as they're passing through each other's trails. Um, so we might be related to life on Alpha Centauri, but, um, you know, but, but I think that, that you just, if you can just get that answer, that tells you 
how common life is and also how uncommon intelligent life is because you know that's what you'll be looking for you you're not just looking for that oxygen in the atmosphere you really want to see the pollution and that tells you that there's an intelligent civilization that's burning up their trees and you know you can even you could probably even tell at what phase and so if we look out and we see pre-industrial or industrial civilizations out there based on their pollution levels and then nothing after that you could almost calculate exactly when the great filter happens you know you could say oh you know we are you know we've got about 42 years until we hit the, the great filter for some reason except You'd think that some other civilization would have figured that out too, looked around the worlds, they, you know, at all the other worlds, gauged the point at which the Great Filter happens, and then really tried to avoid it. Yeah, that's the whole problem is that if we're aware of it, we then, can avoid it. Then we're part of it. We're part of the, the system. Right. right. So, so it has to be. So it has to be something that you cannot avoid, that you cannot be aware of. So something in the laws of physics or yeah, you know, the inevitability of of this discovery being implemented. Um, I have read, and I'm not sure that this is the current thinking, but early in the universe, there were a lot of gamma ray bursts. So it probably would have um, pretty much wiped out any life around them for some distance. Um, that perhaps galaxies haven't been habitable all that long, perhaps just a few billion years. And which, and it, as far as we know, it takes billions of years for life to evolve to. Well, no, I mean, like here on Earth, the uh, life e evolved, you know, the moment it could, pretty much. You know, if you look back and you look at how, how far back life is, that essentially, you know, you time how long the Earth was an uninhabitable molten ball of rock, the gap between those two is not very long you know, a few hundred million years. And so the very earliest moment that life could evolve, life did. The other thing is, is when you think about things like the gamma ray bursts, you know, here on Earth, you know, there's a tremendous ecosystem that exists underground. So, you know, that there is, you know, in the rocks and in under the bottom of the ocean at these, these, these volcanic vents, there's huge colonies of life. And so... Even if life maybe would be wiped off the surface of the planet, there's still a vast ecosystem that exists under the surface, that is under the ocean, that would be completely protected from those kinds of, of astronomical events. So even if, if gamma ray bursts were popping off all around us, that radiation wouldn't get through a kilometer of rock to reach the, the, the creatures But we're talking below. microbes down in those, those habitats. Yeah, but the microbes pop up to the surface and then they recolonize. So, you know, every time you, you, you know, they're, they seep out from these, these aquifers and then they recolonize the planet. So, so again, it's like the, the earth is this, you know, almost indestructible ball filled with life. And you'd have a really hard time wiping out that life. True. Um, of course, we, the evidence we have before us, which is only one example, is that Microbial life evolves almost immediately. Complex life takes a lot longer, right? We were for sure three billion years of of microbes, and before we we had uh, much in the way of fish or even plankton. So um, there, I mean, we don't really know how long it takes life to become complex and then complex life to become technological. That is true, but. You know, we've known that it can happen, and it can happen within the age of the of the universe, and with the within the age of the stars. And so, the point being, if it took, say, it takes three billion years, how many times have, have there been three billion year spans since the age of the galaxy? You know, there's been four, almost five, right? So you could run that experiment five times over on four hundred billion stars, you know, and come up with a result. So the science we can do now is essentially trying to understand how often life evolves on planets. And we pretty much have the technology to start that exploration now. 
Yeah, that's the. I think that's the highest priority. I mean, you know, if I was running NASA, <laughs> which I'm not, um, I would dedicate a lot of resources to answering that fundamental question. You know, are we alone? And and how how often does life occur? You know, if anything, I would send more gyroscopes <laughs> onto the onto these missions. You know, I would launch. Uh, you know, launch Kepler with twelve gyroscopes, not three. Actually, it was the reaction wheels that failed. But well, yeah, I'd send a, a gyros and reaction wheels and little thrusters, and you know, give them whatever they need to make sure that they can never stop pointing, because that always seems to be what goes wrong. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, when I talked to David Grinspoon, he was feeling very good. Kepler pretty much done what they'd set it up to there to do already. I mean, it could do more, but. Well, I the thing with Kepler, right, is that it, it could do more, and and the the. The more part is where it really gets super interesting because with those first three years, you're just getting three years of data. You, you know, like for example, if you have an Earth-sized world orbiting a sun-like star within the habitable zone, you're going to get one crossing after the first year, and you're not going to know how long it took. And then you're going to get another crossing within you know, another year. And that's a, and that's an interesting data point. And then you're going to get that third crossing and that's your, you know, now you've got really good confirmation, but you really want a few more of those. So the problem is that Kepler just at the point where Kepler was starting to turn up the, the most interesting kinds of worlds and to really help confirm them, it, it's, you know, losing functionality. So I, you know, I would launch another Kepler ASAP. Uh, you know that would that could be done for a very reasonable amount of money. Yeah, totally. And then you know launch a terrestrial planet finder or even like a you know a terrestrial atmosphere. You know, there's a great uh, coronagraph uh, plan that's been done where you you launch a you know a sunshade and then sixty thousand kilometers you you trail behind your spacecraft and then you sort of line up the sunshade and the spacecraft so that it just perfectly occults the star and then it leaves the the planets and then you can try and sort of sniff at the atmosphere i would get you know i'd get that spacecraft going as well you know to to do follow ups is there anything else we could we could be looking at studying trying to understand to to try to settle uh, at least eliminate possible answers to the Fermi paradox. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the SETI program is really important too. So there's, I mean, there's the searching for, you know, for the evidence uh, in terms of just like, as I said, looking for the atmospheres of these worlds. And then there's the, then there's the listening. And so I think, you know, if you go and you talk to the folks at the SETI Institute and say, you know, are you, do you feel like you're happily covering all of your bandwidth, you know, out there? No, and they, sure. be like, they, they will no, tell you no. <laughs> no, no. We would like, you know, more telescopes pointed, you know, across more frequencies, pointed at more objects and really boost up the search. And I think that's a, that's a great thing because the great thing about SETI is it's passive. So, you know, you're just listening. And you're not having to transmit anything. You're not having to risk people discovering that we're here or aliens discovering that we're here. We can just listen. And I think as well, it's entirely possible that that aliens are going to be using some other form of communication beyond uh, radio signals. You know, there might be something like neutrinos or something might be a more effective method of communicating. So I think it would be interesting to, to set up things like the the ice cube experiment down in antarctica to to search for neutrinos maybe as a communication signal so i think that you know that it may be a really obvious method of communication that we'll all realize 50 years down the road that you know only an idiot uses only some backward civilization would use radio signals so it'd be interesting to think about what those things are so i would do that and then i think i would also sort of try to comprehensively search for evidence sort of observational evidence of the existence of of uh, civilizations so for example i mean if you had a civilization uh that was that had some you know some kind of asteroid mining facility or a really big space station or some kind of power uh generating structure orbiting its star it would that would create a very unusual signature as this object transited in front of the star from our perspective you know you wouldn't see the light curve rise and fall the way you do with a 
with a regular extrasolar planet, you would see this weird shape to the light curve. And they would, you know, and like, oh, that's a triangle, or oh, that's a, you know, that's a square. And, and so I think that the same thing, in addition to having a spacecraft like Kepler, which is searching for, uh, just for the extrasolar planets, I would also have that spacecraft searching for strange structures orbiting orbiting other stars and then I would also be looking for you know the infrared signatures from Dyson spheres I would be looking for evidence I would be studying you know galaxies to see any evidence that they're being rearranged by their civilizations so I think there's you know there's there's observational evidence there's listening for radio signals and I think there's and then also just exploring here within the within the solar system as well which is great I mean go to Mars look for life do those experiments and see if if we find life there and if it's related to us or not because that'll that'll tell us a lot i mean if we find life on mars and it's not related to us in any way that's amazing um and then the the last thing is i would search for a shadow ecosystem here on earth so i was speaking with paul davies really interesting guy and you know he was saying that that there could very well be a shadow ecosystem a completely different separately evolved form of life that's here on earth that that is bacterial shaped and sized and has very similar processes but we just haven't discovered it because all of the methods that we use to search for life are designed for dna and rna and the various processes that happen in our life forms but you could very well have a shadow life form that kind of looks like bacteria acts like bacteria but actually functions in a completely different way and we're unequipped. But there are ways that you could tease this stuff out of the ecosystem as well. You could, you know, take life, you could take a soil sample, kill all the life in it as we understand it and then see and then keep feeding it and seeing if something else is producing energy or, you know, creating waste in that in that material so so that because then you say oh you know what not only does life evolve on on a planet but it happens multiple times and which would tell you that life is probably more common so is that four main ways to continue the search that's what i do yes and i think that we're we're questionably looking at a multi-generational effort here well of course but you know when you consider the age of the universe you know what's 20 years 40 years to definitively get an answer to this question. Oh, well, it may be 400 years, but... Uh, Still. Or a thousand years. Whatever. We're patient. A thousand years. Well, Fraser, I've got to get going. Uh, I appreciate your time. No problem. It was great to talk to you. The strength of the Fermi Paradox depends on just how prohibitively difficult interstellar travel is. As I see it, this boils down to the energy requirements for interstellar travel and how much time it takes. Duncan Forgan of the University of Edinburgh has an idea about how both requirements can be reduced. Slingshot maneuvers. Yeah. Based on relatively low initial velocities, I think something comparable to the to Voyager leaving the solar system and then slingshotting about a nearby star to go off to a, another star. You found something like a two orders of magnitude reduction in the time it takes to get to another star. Is that yeah. right? And, yeah, and that's, that's right. You were started with very low initial velocity, so you don't, it still takes a long time. But you say in your abstract that... Um, this strengthens Fermi's paradox. By that, do you mean that it, it makes the paradox more of a paradox, or does it, it makes it less of a paradox? I'm not sure if I understood you correctly there. Okay, so the fact that, you know, as a, a fairly basic species, if we could d develop the technology to uh, design a spacecraft that could move at Voyager speed, but also had the sufficient navigational power to carry out this fairly complicated course of, uh, of corrections... Um, then we can explore the galaxy a hundred times faster. And if that's the case, then what, what will happen is that the colonization timescale for the galaxy will get smaller. Uh, and as you probably know, the, the Fermi paradox is based on this idea that the colonization timescale of the galaxy is small compared to, say, the lifetime of a planet or the time it takes for you know, a species to evolve intelligence. 
Um, so the fact that we could take that very small time scale and make it smaller makes Fermi's paradox stronger in the sense that it is more of a paradox. So we now have to think even more carefully about how to resolve it. When I spoke to uh, Jeffrey Landis about this a, a few months ago, he he cautioned against assuming that there would that any kind of central program would be executed by any kind of colonization effort. It'd be more like a each each colonist colonizing probe decides after it arrives whether or not to move on. But you're saying that this is really just a question. This is just a question of time scale. Um, yeah. So this particular paper was concerned with only one probe, and that one probe's goal was to explore every star in uh, a section of the galaxy. Um, right. And in that mission, it achieved it 100 times faster if it carried out these, these slingshot trajectories. Um, what we've gone on to do since then, and we've just submitted this work for publication, uh, we should find out soon if it's been accepted, is to repeat the whole process, but with a fleet of probes that, that replicate and make copies of themselves. Uh, and what we do find is, again, that if you compare a, f a fleet of probes that replicates but doesn't use slingshots compared to a fleet that does replicate and does use slingshots, then you do get another speed up. And the the colonization time scale is something like a million years to 10 million years, which is very quick. Uh, yeah. And it's actually at the lower end of the sort of typical estimates for this kind of time scale when, when trying to formulate the Fermi paradox. So... Uh, Jeffrey is right in the sense that all this is based on motivation and what we've assumed is that these probes are motivated to explore every star in the galaxy and not stop until that is finished. But obviously we're, we're not privy to the, uh, the whims of the, the alien species that launched these probes. So we don't know for a fact that this is what they're trying to do. If, if I understood your initial paper correctly, if you're doing a slingshot maneuver, it really only helps you a lot if your velocity is roughly uh, 1% of the speed of light. Beyond that, it, you need to go by a much more exotic object. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So the, the way the slingshot works, um, you get a larger speed up if you go closer to the star. And at some point, there, the speed up you get is so small that to get any bigger of a speed up, you have to get so close that you, you go within the star's envelope. And obviously that's a bad idea. So what you want is an object that's more dense, so it's more compact, but has the same gravitational energy. So what we suggested would be that if you wanted to really speed things up, you'd need to find compact objects like neutron stars, black holes, anything that has a large mass but a low radius. Uh, obviously there are bigger problems trying to skim past a black hole and catch a, a speed boost. Um, obviously... Things like uh, general relativity would come into play there. Um, you'd be subjecting your spacecraft to very strong shear and tidal forces. So it's not entirely clear to me at this point that you should do that. That, that may rip the whole thing apart. So obviously we'd have to think a bit more carefully about how you would do that calculation and whether you would even want to. So the, the, the real interesting point is that with current technology and enough time, we could get to 1% of the speed of light with almost no extra energy compared to what we did in launching the Voyager. So that in itself is interesting. I'll be back with some additional thoughts on the Fermi Paradox in a few minutes. But first, this music from DJ Spooky.
my own strategy for approaching the Fermi Paradox is from a stance of epistemic humility. The best summary of this is what is known as Haldane's Law. Biologist J.B.S. Haldane stated it thus, The universe is not only queerer than we imagine, it is queerer than we can imagine. When we think about advanced extraterrestrial civilizations, we have little choice but to think about them as if they were just a variation on humans. But we have to recognize that we are almost certainly wrong when we do this. While it is reasonable to believe that there may be some universal laws of biology, once past the stage of living beings as survival machines for their genes, or whatever the alien analog of genes is, projecting human motivations and drives onto aliens may be the only way we can proceed. But epistemic humility, which is not epistemic timidity, tells us that this will lead to hypotheses that are very likely wrong. So, these hypotheses will fail the best tests we can devise. The good news is that if we are patient and persistent, we will find better hypotheses as a result of our search. What is beyond those tests? Tests such as the probing of planetary atmospheres and the patient listening for alien radio transmissions? These are questions that we not only do not imagine now, but we can't imagine now. I intend to keep asking the questions raised by the Fermi Paradox and to keep promoting the research in astrobiology and SETI that will give us sharper questions. Today, I have no idea how to resolve the Fermi Paradox. Neither do you. And if it is pat answers that you live for, you will die unhappy. Signal Podcast, seal of podcast approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. Every episode since episode four, I single out one particularly meritorious podcast, other than this one, for recognition. At wowsignalpodcast.com, there is a list of these with links to their homepages. The sixth Wow Signal Podcast, seal of approval for podcasting, is awarded to Penn's Sunday School. This weekly podcast is a project of outspoken magician and reality TV star Penn Gillette. It mostly features Penn sitting around with a few of his friends talking about what he's been up to lately, and also features some really interesting guests. My favorite episode so far was with Penn's longtime partner, Teller. Yes, he talks, talking about his plans for producing Shakespeare's The Tempest, But there are many other cool guests as well. This is just talk, but it is interesting, funny, and often deeply insightful talk. I would warn, though, that those sensitive to coarse language and sexual frankness had better steer clear. There are some ads, but Penn reads all of them himself and tries to make them as amusing as possible. So tune into Penn Sunday School for thought-provoking laughter, if you don't mind some bad language. You have just heard the Wow Signal Podcast, podcast seal of approval for podcasting as part of the podcast.
Thanks for joining me again on this episode of the Wow Signal Podcast. I hope you're as interested in the multi-generational enterprise to search for ET intelligence as I am. I'd love to hear what you think about this episode and this podcast in general. If you want to comment on this episode or any episode of the Wow Signal Podcast, you can leave a comment on the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com or join our Google Plus community. You can also follow me on Twitter at Paul D, D as in David, Carr. I continue to look for just the right co-host and co-producer for this podcast. If you were fascinated by the topics this podcast covers and want to get into podcasting but don't want to start your own, why not send me an email at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. With the right person or persons, the episodes will not only be more frequent, but of higher quality. The next episode will cover some different and creative strategies for searching for ET. I know I will have Ben Wright McGee and Paul Shook in that episode, and possibly Dr. Paul Davies, author of An Eerie Silence. I also know that I owe you an episode on the real wow signal, and I am trying to track down the right experts to talk to me about that one as well. I want to thank Fraser Kane and Duncan Forgan for their contributions, and our musical artists, John Baez, Greg Egan, DJ Spooky, Aluchatistas, and Jason Robinson. Links to learn more about all these folks will be in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. Also, Thanks to our voiceover artists, Joyce Abma and Aaron Carr. And now here's a little more music from Jason Robinson. Take us out. This is called Elbow Grease. Introduction. This has been Episode 9 of the WOW Signal Podcast. The spoken content of the WOW Signal Podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. All music is presented with the permission of the artists. To comment on this episode or to learn more about the Fermi Paradox, please visit the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. Thank <laughs> you.